Hello everyone and welcome back to support group for uh, Penn Medicine Bariatrics. My name is Colleen Tewksbury and I'm the Bariatric Program Manager. Uh, if you are a regular for these meetings, I'm happy to see you here again. If you're new to this group, uh, welcome. We're excited to have you here. So today is all about nutrition. It is all about protein. So we have joining us today um, Leah Casella. She is uh, one of our team directors dietitians based out of the uh, Perlman Center location uh, and the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but she is She's been with us for about three years now, a little bit more than that. Uh, we are happy to have her joining us. Uh, previously worked in weight management and obesity treatment uh, on the western side of the state, and we were happy to have her join our team here in uh, the Philadelphia area. She has uh, advanced training in weight management uh, and dietetics through the uh, Commission on Dietetic Registration and completed the Certificate of Training in Adult Obesity and interventions. So we are happy to have her here and um, in her free time and actually while she's working, um, we're always hoping to see uh, one of her pups, either uh, Rita or Ralph, pop into the screen. So we're always we're always waiting and hoping that we get to see a glimpse of Rita or Ralph here today. Uh, but welcome, Leah. We're happy to have you. you here. Great. Thank you so much, Colleen. And yes, apologize if anyone's ever heard my dogs barking in the background. It doesn't happen much, so try to keep them on the, the down low. <laughs> no need to apologize. All right, Leah, if you wanted to uh, open up that share tray and pull back up your slides, that'd be wonderful. And we'll start talking about protein. Excellent. Thanks, Colleen. All right. Very good. So like Colleen said, today is all about protein. Um, so just put together a few slides to get us some talking points to learn a little bit more about the role of protein, why it's so important, um, and then we can kind of brainstorm some different ways that we can get our protein in our diet, especially after surgery when it becomes a little bit more difficult. So just a few main points here to highlight about why protein is so important and why you hear us talk about it so much. Um, it is essential, so that means we have to get protein from our diet, which I'm sure you guys have heard us discuss with you. Um, it provides a lot of structural support, so it's found in nearly every body part, including our muscles, our organs, bones, hair, skin, nails. And our body is constantly breaking down and rebuilding these proteins. So if we don't get enough protein from our diet day to day, then our bodies can't rebuild. Um, and that can lead to a loss of lean muscle, which we wanna prevent. That lean muscle helps to keep us strong, helps to promote a healthy metabolism. Protein is also important to maintain your nutritional status. It helps with sense of satiety and fullness at mealtime and it's also gonna to help to support immunity. So this is probably familiar to a lot of you, but something that we work with you on is becoming more aware of where protein comes from in the diet. Um, so if you guys wanna use the chat box feature to kind of discuss what your favorite type of protein is, your favorite source of protein in the diet, where you tend to get most of your protein from, um, and that can be a great talking point as well. So we have, of course, our animal products are a main source. We have our meat, our poultry, seafood, eggs, our dairy products, including yogurts and cheeses. Uh, my personal favorite, not everyone's, but I do like cottage cheese, Greek yogurt. Uh, and then we have our vegetarian sources, so our beans, lentils, tofu or other soy products, and our nuts and seeds. Now, when we're choosing those proteins, it's always best to stick to lean protein choices. Uh, that way we're still getting that high nutrient dense choice, but able to keep the saturated fat low, keep the calories low. Uh, so there's some ways that we can do this, sticking to low fat or non-fat dairy products, choosing leaner cuts of meat, trimming the fat, 
um, or avoiding the skin, which holds on to a lot of that fat, and then leaner preparation methods. So choosing things that are baked, grilled, trying to avoid the fried foods. Um, I don't know if anyone has tried anything made in an air fryer, but that's something that I got recently and have really enjoyed experimenting with that. You can really put anything in there. Uh, so again, feel free if there's anything you've thrown into the air fryer or new recipes that you've tried to share them in the chat function for others as well. So how much protein do we need? Uh, this is something that we also kind of drill into your heads, especially in that pre-op period to get that 60 to 80 grams of protein a day. Your body actually needs additional protein during periods of rapid weight loss, like after having weight loss surgery, to help minimize the amount of muscle that you lose and to help maintain that healthy metabolism. So we know if we don't get enough protein in our diet, then our body's gonna take that protein from the muscles, may make us feel weak. Um, so definitely starting before surgery, trying to become more familiar with getting that protein in. So 60 to 80 grams can be quite a bit of protein, especially for someone who's had weight loss surgery. Um, and it can be difficult, especially early post-op when you have the physical restriction, so you can't eat quite as much. Uh, you also may notice you have some taste changes, so maybe some foods or protein shakes that you liked before surgery you don't like anymore. Um, and then also potential food intolerances that may make it more difficult for you to get in all your protein. So some tips and tricks of what we can do to help ensure we get our protein in. The first is just to start becoming more familiar with the protein content of the foods that we are eating. Uh, so taking a look at our labels, seeing what a serving size is, how many grams of protein are in that serving, and then tracking our intake, measuring our portions out, uh, getting a general idea of how much protein is in those foods, how much we're getting at each meal, and then seeing where we fall for the day. It also can be helpful as you're meal planning, as you're plating your meal, to kind of take a, a deep breath and just ask yourself, okay, where's the protein coming from? Um, and making sure that that is the priority on the plate. So before anything else, we always want to prioritize that protein. And if we can't find it on our plate, we want to rearrange things to make sure that that is the main focus. So moving on to protein shakes, and as we're talking about this, um, I know everyone has different personal favorites. So again, feel free, please use the chat function, kind of share your favorite protein powders or protein shakes, ready-made shakes, um, because protein shakes are going to be something that is a necessity early post-op. Real whole food is always going to be the best bet when it comes to your protein source after surgery, but definitely those first few months, the protein shakes are a, a necessity. During that time, it's almost near impossible to get all your protein in from whole foods alone. So the shakes definitely play a role in supplementing your intake. And you'll also find they tend to keep you fuller, more so in that early post-op period than they will further down the road. So with all the different products out there, um, a few key points to look for. Whey protein, especially whey protein isolate, is going to be the top quality. Um, and it's lactose free, so it tends to be easier to digest. You do wanna find one that gives you at least 20 grams of protein and less than five grams of sugar per serving. Um, so keeping that higher protein, lower sugar ratio. And then again, needing to supplement your diet until you're comfortable getting that 60 to 80 grams of protein just through food alone. Now, as time goes on, the further out you get from surgery and the swelling goes down, you're able to tolerate more foods, it can be helpful to start eating more dense protein foods versus the softer or liquid proteins, as those are gonna help you to feel fuller longer and feel more restriction. Um, so it's also helpful if you're you know, years out from surgery 
and you're wondering why you're feeling hungry so soon after eating, even though you had a protein, maybe to take a look back and, and see, maybe I can incorporate a little bit more of a dense protein, something like you know chicken or, or something along those lines. Now, of course, these tougher proteins can be more difficult for some to digest um, and to tolerate. So there are a few ways that we can help to minimize that intolerance. Uh, one of those being using moist cooking methods to prepare your proteins. So using maybe like a low sugar marinade um, or uh, cook it in a crock pot with like a jar of salsa or chicken broth. I've also discovered that non-fat plain Greek yogurt is a great marinade to kind of help retain some of that moisture in our meats and chicken. Um, and then being mindful of how often you're reheating food, especially those proteins in the microwave, because the more we reheat it, we know the more it dries it out. Um, so just avoiding reheating multiple times. So if you have any methods or any maybe favorite low sugar marinades that you like to use, um, again, feel free to share with the group. The other piece to tolerating these more dense proteins is practicing mindful eating habits. So again, it goes back to the basics where we're making sure we take bite-sized pieces, chewing 20, 25 times, really starting digestion on your plate where you're cutting it up really small and then pureeing it in your mouth, pausing between bites, um, and that tends to really help us tolerate these a little bit more dense proteins more so than if we eat too quickly or don't chew our foods well enough. All right, now the next handful of slides, I thought it would be a little uh, game here to figure out how much protein are in these foods listed. So again, you can use the chat function to figure that out or to type in your answer there. So first here we have guess the protein in a half a cup cooked black beans. If you wanna give it a shot, what you, how, much, how many grams of protein you think are in a half a cup cooked black beans? All right, so for that in a half a cup cooked beans, it's roughly about eight grams. Eight grams of protein. So how about in one ounce or roughly about 25 almonds? How many grams of protein do you think? So we know in about one ounce of almonds, we're going to get roughly six grams of protein. Okay. All right, and then we have the two ounce of shrimp, which is about seven shrimp cooked. So how many grams of protein you think in that? All right, so we get about 14 grams of protein in the two ounces of shrimp. And then finally here we have a three ounce chicken breast, uh, which is about a half of a small chicken breast. Um, so how many grams of protein do you think are in that? So that's gonna vary, but probably around 21, 24 grams of protein um, in that chicken breast. A good kind of general rule of thumb for animal proteins like chicken or fish is one ounce is roughly seven grams of protein. Um, so that's a kind of a good number to keep in mind. One ounce, roughly seven grams. All right. So with that said, what does 60 to 80 grams of protein a day actually look like if we were to put together these meals? Uh, so these next slides here are actually taken off of this Instagram, bariatric.meal.prep. Um, so she is a bariatric dietitian who has an Instagram page. Uh, so that's where I pulled these resources for, but I thought it was a great visual to really get an idea of 
how much food we'd have to eat to get this 70, 60 to 80 grams of protein. So we can see here for this data, kind of give you an idea of what these items are. Um, at breakfast, that's a Greek yogurt, which gets you the 12 grams of protein. For lunch, we have three ounce meatballs, a quarter cup of beans, a Greek yogurt dressing over about a half cup of lettuce. For a snack, that's about a half cup of cottage cheese. And then for dinner, they have kind of a deconstructed chicken fajita bowl. So that's about three ounce chicken, a quarter cup of refried beans, and a third of a cup of peppers. So you can see they spread their protein evenly throughout the day between meals and snacks um, and total about 70 grams of protein. So they were able to get that in even without the help of a protein shake. Now a little bit different, so 68 grams of protein. Um, this shows us what a day would look like if we fall a little bit short at our meals and then need that protein shake to help get you up to that 60 to 80. So for breakfast, they have the high protein pancakes here, something like a Kodiak cakes or um, adding protein powder to a pancake mix for about nine grams. Lunch, they have the two hard boiled eggs, a third of a cup snap peas and a small orange. Uh, the first snack of the day was a quarter cup of hummus with some carrots. Second snack of the day would be that protein shake for 30 grams of protein right there. And then at dinner, they have a chicken sausage, a quarter cup sweet potato, and a third of a cup pepper and onions. Can't I just take a pill? Um, unfortunately, no, we cannot get the nutrition, the protein that our bodies needs from, need from a supplement. Um, and we know that whole foods provide so much more than just protein. Uh, they're going to keep you fuller longer. They're going to aid in that satiety, but they're also going to give you a variety of nutrients that we can't just get from a manufactured product. We also know that to maximize your, ability, your body's ability to use that protein and to aid in that, that fullness, that satiety, we want to make sure we spread our intake of protein evenly throughout the day, similar to what we saw in those two sample days. So what that would look like, uh, portions are going to vary depending on the poor person and the type of protein, but about that two to five ounce protein at each meal, uh, which would equal about 15 to 35 grams of protein per meal. So just kind of a summary again to reinforce that we, our bodies can't create our own protein without getting protein from a food source. Um, and that's necessary because again, we're constantly breaking down and rebuilding and protein is key to minimize that lean muscle mass loss, um, support a healthy metabolism, and then it's also gonna increase satiety. That goal, that number to, st to remember is that 60 to 80 grams, trying to spread throughout the day. Um, and then hopefully this gives you some few ideas as far as where to get that protein from, what that looks like as far as how much protein to focus on at each meal. We have a lot of great comments and questions for you uh, lined up. So I want to uh, start off here with some of the items that are um, direct and straightforward because we have a lot going on in the chat function. We have over a hundred uh, different messages that people have entered in. Phenomenal, love it. So this is a bit of nutrition trivia. And if you're not sure of the answer, you can always phone a friend named Colleen here. Right. Um, James is asking, do egg whites have the same protein as uh, amount as regular eggs? Good question, James. Yeah, so I don't know the specifics, but I believe an egg white might have like four grams of protein, if I'm not mistaken, whereas a whole egg, depending on the size, might be like six to eight grams. Do you know yes. this? Nailed yeah. it on the head, Leah. Excellent yes. points yeah. for you, 50 <laughs> points. Um, so uh, what's interesting to know is that the yolk, although lower in protein, it's more protein dense 
So the the amount of space or volume that you get, you actually have more protein in compared to the white. However, you also have that cholesterol with it. So uh, you are right, though. There's more protein in the whites in and of themselves. Excellent. All right. So we have a lot of questions in here around um, plant based proteins. So mm -hmm. so a lot going on here. So I'm going to pose a few different questions for you that are all in the same theme here. So um, Jay is asking whether or not her uh, uh, plant and uh, and milk-based protein shakes are okay. We had a few questions about some popular plant-based proteins out there. Um, Tina's asking, what are some of the protein options for vegans? Um, and we have a few other questions around uh, what are some of the different plant-based proteins that are out there? Yeah, so as far as um, protein powders that are plant-based. A lot of them that I've been seeing use a pea protein um, or a soy protein or brown rice protein. So they might be a combination of any of those. Um, generally speaking, you still want to follow the guidelines where hopefully it gives you at least the 20 grams of protein, less than five grams of sugar per serving. Um, now, if someone is strictly plant-based doing more of a vegan diet, we may have to supplement with an amino acid that would be limited in these plant-based options um, versus if someone is just incorporating a plant-based shake plus they eat yogurt and they drink milk. So that would be something we could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with. Um, one of the plant-based uh, powders that I've tried and is actually pretty good is I might mispronounce, but Vega or Vega, I think it's Vega, um, but they have some good and they're typically pea protein based. Yeah, excellent. And we do also have a question then from Tanya of when would actually be a good time to go vegan? So that is a probably a loaded question. I guess it depends <laughs> on your motivation for why you want to go vegan. Um, so it would really depend on the person, but I would think if you are pre-op starting, and that's your goal, then starting before surgery is going to give you more time, more practice to start incorporating these vegan foods versus experimenting after surgery. Um, so I guess it depends on where you are in the process and what your, your reason for, what, what your why is. Yeah, I would always strongly suggest you pick up the phone and call a dietitian, right? That's what we're here for. Right. We have uh, nine dietitians on our team and we're here to help you with uh, figuring that out and navigating with the best choice for you. Uh, so strongly suggest you give us a call and I will put our phone number in the chat. So uh, Leah, we have a couple of questions here around um, whether or not how you can manipulate different foods to make them feel more satisfying. So we have questions around Greek yogurt and how that might be um, uh, certain brands might be more satisfying than others. Is that something that they do to the yogurt? Uh, we have questions around boosting fiber without adding too many carbs to, to help with that satisfying aspect, but without increasing your, your carbohydrate and calorie uh, intake. So Leah, do you have any suggestions on how you can modify? I think we oftentimes talk about this as like macros, uh, modifying your macros to be able to help with uh, increasing satiety while not increasing caloric intake. What what are your tips? Uh, yeah, great question because you do want to feel satisfied. You don't want to feel like you're restricting. Um, I know personally, to go back to the first question with yogurt, I find yogurt that has a little bit of fat in it to be much more satisfying than say a fat-free yogurt. Now it will add a little bit more calories. So you do just want to make sure you're tracking for that. But that combination where you have that protein plus a little bit of fat, and then we can add in some fiber is really what's going to help to keep you full, keep you satisfied. Um, so I don't know if there's certain brands you've tried that or whoever posed that question that they noticed, maybe the brand that kept them fuller longer did have a slightly higher fat content. Uh, as far as the fiber goes, so definitely looking at th the sources of fiber, of course, your non-starchy vegetables are going to be more of the lower calorically dense, higher fiber foods that we can increase in volume at our meals. Um, ideally looking at every meal and asking yourself not only where that protein is coming from, but also that fiber piece uh, and trying to focus primarily on that lean protein source, then your veggies, 
And then if we have room, that's where the, the carbohydrates would come in, the starches. Um, so that could be one way to increase the fiber, load up on those non-starchy veggies. Um, also things like a small amount of ground flaxseed sprinkled into your yogurt to go back to the yogurt could add some fiber, some healthy fats, help you feel full without adding a lot of extra calories. Berries, um, other high fiber fruits as well would be a great addition. And then also you can look at foods that give you both the protein and the fiber, um, things like beans, lentils, edamame is a personal favorite. I don't know if you guys have ever tried the dry roasted edamame, um, but I wanna say like a third of a cup gets you somewhere close to 13 grams of protein and maybe eight or nine grams of fiber. So that way you're getting both in the one product so you don't have to increase the volume. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So let's, um, if you don't mind, Leah, let's shift gears yeah. for a second and go back to, to protein shakes. So we have a few different questions here about protein shakes. So let's start off um, with, is it normal for your stomach not to accept the protein shakes and for them to just not sit well? We have a question from Stephanie around that. And then okay. additionally from an anonymous uh, attendee right now saying that when, um, they are talking while eating, they get a runny nose and sneeze because they're not mindful, it hurts their stomach. So are there certain items around protein that people need to be worried about in terms of how it's going to affect them physically and how they're physically going to feel? Yeah, so great question. Um, to answer Stephanie's, the first one, it could be if you are sensitive to lactose, which is the sugar in milk, um, a lot of the protein shakes or protein um, powders are whey based. Now, uh, if you remember from the slides a while back, whey protein isolate will be lactose free, but whey protein concentrate is going to have some milk sugar in it. So some people do okay if the only source of lactose in their diet is the protein shake. But if you're eating yogurt and you have a protein shake and some cheese later, you know, it just adds up and it might be too much. So you could always take a closer look to see, is my product lactose free? And if not, let me try to switch to one that is lower in lactose or a, a whey protein isolate option. Could also be too, if you mix your protein powder with something, um, if you're mixing it with milk, of course, or adding fruits or chia seeds or flax seeds, just trying to eliminate those to see if that makes a difference as well. All right, excellent. And along those lines, what is the difference between whey protein isolate and whey protein concentrate? Yeah, so whey protein isolate, it's the the pro, or the filtering process. So it's going to be, um, I, I don't know if ultra filtered is the right word, but they filter out that lactose. So it's a higher concentration of protein compared to carbohydrates, essentially. Um, so that's the big, but they're both great quality protein sources. You'll see a lot will have a combination, a blend of both the isolate and the concentrate. All right, excellent. And uh, let's keep going down those lines of protein. So any upside or downside to having more than 80 grams of protein in a day? And this question, um, they're, they're both for, uh, from anonymous individuals um, go hand in hand. Is there a limit to the amount of protein that your body can actually absorb at one time? Yeah, so to address the first question, um, some people do need more than 80 grams of protein. So that would be something, you know, we would one-on-one -on -one with your dietitian, we would discuss based on your gender, your height, your weight, your activity level. Um, but there, the downside to getting too much protein would be a few things. One, if you're getting more protein that than your body needs and you're staying within your calories, it could be displacing other nutrients in your diet or taking up the space of other nutrients in your diet, like, for example, fiber. Um, so perhaps it's holding you back from getting more of a balance in your diet. The other piece is if you get more protein than your body needs, essentially you're just getting extra calories and you're eating more calories than your body needs as well. So that can take you over your calorie goal. Um, it can be dehydrating too. So you wanna make sure you're you know, getting enough fluids in there, but those would be the main points um, that we would look at for getting too much protein. 
the second question, I can't remember. <laughs> ah, it was um, how much protein can you uh, your body absorb at one time? Yeah, so it's more what your body will be able to use uh, or how your body will be able to use protein more efficiently when you spread it evenly throughout the day. And I believe the numbers are anywhere from like 30 to 40 grams. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about 30 to 40 grams per meal uh, max. The max would be that 30 to 40 grams. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Anything more than that, uh, the body just denatures and, and uses for, for other uh, uses. <laughs> There's no way to, to store protein in a large amount in the body. Yeah. So uh, these go hand in hand as well. So um, getting a little bit more into weight control items, uh, we have questions around how do you know how many calories you need? There's a lot of questions in the chat around like, wait, so if this is my protein recommendation, What's my calorie recommendation? How do I figure that out? Yeah, so definitely that would be something one on one with the dietitian. We would again look at your activity, your age, your height, your gender, all that plays a big role in how many calories your body needs each day. Um, for anyone, though, a great starting point is just to start tracking your calories because then we can get a general idea of how many calories your body is currently taking in. And we can look at trends. If you're maintaining on that current level, then we know, all right, if the goal is weight loss, we can start to reduce. If the goal is weight gain, we can start to increase. Um, so I think becoming more familiar with how many calories you're taking in and then bringing that to your dietitian, and then we can work with you to come up with more of an exact number. Yeah, and this gets us to, uh, to a question from an anonymous uh, participant of what's What's the problem with starchy veggies versus non-starchy veggies when you were talking about the difference earlier? Yeah, so th there's nothing wrong with starchy vegetables. They are just going to be a higher source of carbohydrates. So that means they're going to provide more calories per serving than the non-starchy. So the starchy vegetables would be things like corn, peas, potatoes. So when you look at your plate, a quote-unquote bariatric plate would be about half protein, the other half mostly your non-starchy veggies, and then the smallest section coming from your carbohydrates, which your starchy vegetables would fall into there. So you just don't get as much bang for your buck uh, calorie-wise from the non-starchy as the starchy. Yeah, and um, this is a question from Jake here, and I, I can speak to this a little bit. So for the total daily energy expenditure expenditure calculators that are available, are they accurate? Um, so there is a um, slight, we're going to go into nuance here, and, and as Leah was uh, mentioning here as well, is that we can calculate out how many calories approximately your body needs but that doesn't always match up to the measurement of how much you're actually taking in, along with estimating out your caloric expenditures. So we don't live in a vacuum, we don't live in a lab, we're not having all of our food measured out for the most part in a uh, laboratory setting to be absolutely accurate. So it's all going off of trends. So those generally are pretty accurate, but studies have actually shown time and time again that even if you're really on top of tracking your calorie intake in, and also how many calories you're expending through exercise, individuals typically underestimate how many calories they're taking in by about 40 to 50% and underestimate how many calories they're expending, sorry, overestimate how many calories they're expending by about 30 to 50 percent. So there are margins of error involved here as well that throw that off. So what Leah was talking about is even if you're overestimating or underestimating, it's finding your starting point and working off of trends from there for you individually. So um, not to get into the weeds of those calculators, but th they have a time and a place, but and they're helpful, but it's how do you actually use them, which which brings us back to, to Leah's point of finding your starting point and, and moving from there. Um, so Leah, we have a, a question here about um, what if you just wanted to do just straight up protein shakes, uh, go the uh, meal replacement route for just having protein shakes throughout the day? What are your thoughts? So I am not a fan of just doing protein shakes um, because again, you can't manufacture 
the the whole nutrition that you get from eating whole foods. Um, and we know they're not going to leave you. It's not as satisfying to drink your calories for every meal as it is to sit down, chew your food, enjoy your food, plan your meals. Um, so they do have their place. Of course, they have their role early post-op, those first few months for sure. And a lot of times patients will use them to replace a meal as a way to control calories. So they absolutely have their place, but as something long-term and um, every single meal of the day, it doesn't teach us how to eat. And it's something that's not sustainable in the long run. Yeah, all right, excellent. So I am going to hit a few of the questions here just so that people get their, their answers. We can't get to everybody's questions, but we're, we're gonna try here and then we'll wrap up with uh, uh, one or two last questions for Leah. Um, so if someone is getting in their protein, their liquids and they're stuck at a stall, first thing you want to do is pick up the phone and give us a call. There are a lot of things that can cause for your weight loss to start to plateau out after surgery, but keeping in mind that we don't typically categorize something as a plateau until about three to four weeks of no weight change. That would be a technical plateau and what we would expect someone to be at net calorie neutral. And the reason being is you have to go off of trends. There are lots of things that can affect weight, bowel movements, hydrated, dehydrated. Um, if you're um, on the, the female side, where are you at in your menstrual cycle? Um, men also have hormonal cycles as well. So looking at trends overall is very important. Benefiber after surgery, very small amounts, but you also have to compensate with liquid. So if you would like to integrate in Benefiber after surgery, or any sort of fiber um, uh, supplement, it is best to contact your dietitian. That's gonna be my answer for a lot of these. Uh, so if someone's experiencing hair loss as well, uh, we don't get into the weeds of that here. It's very rare to see major hair loss caused by protein malnutrition. Someone's pretty malnourished um, for it to be rooted in protein malnutrition, to experience, it'd be experiencing hair loss. So if you are experiencing hair loss, it's very individualized for, for significant hair loss give us a call. We'll walk through and see what's going on and try and pinpoint what might be happening. Um, so with sugar as well, uh, there are no technical sugar recommendations per se. The dietary guidelines just recommended under, um, I believe, Leah, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's down to under 60 grams of added sugar per day. Because of two weeks ago. Oh, see, I don't know the update. Yes, I, it's a very long document and I, I have to read through everything for that, but I believe it's under 60 grams per day. In terms of after surgery, there's not really a hard and fast number. So um, for the fruits and veggies, sorry, for the fruits and other items for sugar containing, it's as you feel comfortable for ad adding those back in. But again, talk to your dietitian. Um, so, uh, from there, I want to make sure that I hit the, the main big items. Um, I think ultimately it comes down to contact us if you have any questions. So Leah, I'm going to leave you with um, two questions here that I'd like you to speak on that are really looking for, is what I'm doing okay? They're looking looking for approval here. So um, we have a question from Deborah, um, who's to be able to meet her protein goal, she has to eat four separate times a day. Uh, is that all right? And then we also have from Stephanie, who's really concerned about the frequency of eating and when does it cross over from snacking into grazing? So what's the optimal frequency of eating in a day after surgery? Yeah, great questions. And uh, for the first half, so Deborah, definitely totally fine to eat those four times a day to get your protein in. Um, and to kind of tie that into Stephanie's concern, what is most important is you want to make sure those are structured meals or snacks where each meal has a start and an end time. And that's going to help to minimize that grazing behavior. Um, so what that means is when you sit down to the meal, give yourself that 20 to 30 minutes. But if you're not done after 30, 40 max, kind of call it quits versus picking on it. Uh, or going back an hour later to finish it. So still having that structure throughout the day. The same ideas for snacks. So having a planned out, portioned out snack that you put on a plate, you sit at the table, is a lot different 
then grabbing a handful here and there and kind of picking throughout the day mindlessly. Um, so for, I think Stephanie was the second question, to minimize that grazing, having a plan where you have those three meals a day, maybe one or two protein-based snacks is typically a, a good um, structure for someone who's had weight loss surgery. All right, excellent. And Leah, we have a few comments on here um, of patients who are, are vouching for your expertise and um, thanking you for your uh, wonderful care uh, that you, you provide day in and day out to, to all of our patients.